material, I may not have, I saved my PDF. I don't think I posted it yet to Slack, so sorry. I think I need to still do that. Is that correct? I didn't post it yet. No one saw a giant PDF file on Slack. Did you? No. Oh, the slides, I did remember to post them. Okay, I've been doing so many things. I can't even remember. Fine. If they're not there, then I will repost. It, it's okay. Um, rather than just wrap up with yesterday's lecture, I, I mean, I think you got the spirit of it. I went through an arc yesterday of trying to introduce some basics of how epidemic spread works, some of the concepts of speed, strength, and then size, and then went through and unpacked what is it that theorists and theory can do that's useful during a pandemic, and tried to emphasize really public interventions. Underlying those public interventions were principles. Those principles are helpful, but we can't view them as sacrosanct. We can't view them as things that can't be changed. And we need to update our understanding in light of both data and, and obviously it's an emerging infectious disease. There are going to be differences. Today, though, I wanted to reestablish the foundations in a bit slower, more deliberate fashion. Some of this may be review. Nonetheless, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. That'll probably take me about half the class, maybe a little bit longer to make sure I do that. And then I'm going to begin to extend the basic models in different directions. So I have a sort of choose your own adventure path today, but I think I, I know which adventure path I want to take. Did, when you were kids, did you have these books where you could choose which page to turn to? Was that an Italian thing too or in other places? Do you know what I'm talking about? You, you had a book and if you choose this, you turn to page 75, or if you do the other, you turn to page 32. Do you remember these books? Okay, fine. So it's a little bit of that spirit today where I had a bunch of modules and I can go, but uh, it's too complicated to choose your own adventure. So I think what I'm going to do today is the foundations, and then I'll talk about one aspect in which I go away from some of these simplified models, which is considering the impacts of heterogeneity. How does heterogeneity change the very rules and principles that I'm about to explain? Tomorrow, then, I do have a couple options. One of them, which I'll definitely do, is expand on this notion of generation intervals. Right? And then I think I'll probably also talk about behavior tomorrow in some way. So that allows me to hit on the foundations and some of the frailties of these models, but also address fixes. Just methodologically, so that we're all on the same page, today I'll be using, for the first part, mostly sort of standard nonlinear uh, dynamics methods, linearization, and so on emphasizing intuition, though in the second part of the class I hope to extend a little bit to show you how there's a structured model and in fact you could in fact think of these eventually as PDEs. I won't do so much there. It turns out you can do some nice analysis in other ways. And then tomorrow uh, I will use some uh, integral differential frameworks to try to understand g uh, generation intervals. So we'll see how that goes. So hopefully you'll learn a few methods as well. Thursday, then just to keep everyone on track today, I'm obviously here, tomorrow I'm here, but then I leave right after lecture tomorrow because of my flight back on Thursday. Thursday's lecture will be a laboratory, and just to remind everyone, I would like, not would like, I'm asking anyone who's taking this for a grade to send me back their Jupyter notebooks before class on Thursday. I will create some sort of link for you to deposit so that you can put it there is I don't need 37 messages on Slack. That's the last thing. I just need them all in one place. And so I will put together some Dropbox link or Google form where you can deposit it. OK, so I haven't explained or I haven't figured out how I'm going to do it, but I will figure it out and I'll get that to you. Any questions before I begin? Just wanted to get some housekeeping things in order. So then Thursday, I'll go over the laboratories that you did, go over some of the solutions. And I will also give you a new laboratory, and then we won't be able to get to the end of it. I will share the solutions afterwards. So even though I'm not with you, you will have the references for how you do that kind of work. And we'll emphasize a stochastic model of epidemics in the laboratory. OK, I think I've given enough preface. Questions? No? Good. Let's, uh, not necessarily good, but that's how it goes. Let's start. So what I wanted to start with again today are epidemic basics, and I'm going to gradually build up in some complexity. So take, you know, uh, take it easy, it'll, it'll be fine, and then maybe it'll get more complicated, maybe not. I want to begin by reminding folks that typically one writes these standard SIR models 
as the following, where there's some infection rate, there's a recovery rate, and we get this sort of expectation for dynamics. But I want to first unpack where this comes from in the first place. How do we interpret each one of these parameters? Okay. So we should think, at the start, you notice we have this beta. We have a population. And we have all these individuals in this population. And maybe one of them is infected. Right? And we want to know what happens. And so we can think of this in different ways. We can think of both the susceptible individual or the infected individuals as having C contacts per unit time. And let's think of it from the perspective of the infectious individual. And it really depends on where I want to put this, divide by n factor. But they have C contacts, like some contact rate. Of those contacts, S over n will be susceptible. Of those contacts with susceptible people, P, some probability of infection given contact. OK? So we have this notion that the susceptible individual or the infected individual is contacting around people. If we take the perspective of the infectious individual, there's some chance that they've run into a susceptible person at the beginning. It's almost certain that they have because everyone else is susceptible. And there's a chance of transmission, which means that we could have something like, for each I individual, C, S over N, P, new infections per time which we write as beta i s over n, and we identify beta as cp. OK? So I'm just trying to unpack a little bit of what happens. And so this is then a model in which we have a population that's fixed, and we may be transitioning certain elements. So we're going to make the further assumption that we ignore in this time scale births and deaths so that there is a constraint on the total number. OK? So if we have this model, we have this constraint, now we understand a little bit of where that beta comes from, we end up getting this n, this population size in the mix. So we would like to rewrite things. And, and soon after just this next little section here, I'm going to rewrite things so that we think of them as fractions. I note, though, however, that when we do our laboratory on Thursday, I'm going to get back to this notion of individuals. So I wanted to remind you that these are actually individuals. Because if we want to build a stochastic simulation, we have to think, do we have 100 individuals, or 1,000, or 10,000? And how many actual infectious individuals is going to make a difference in terms of how quickly the next infection event happens? Right? Nonetheless, we can rescale all of this. And I'll do a standard thing. And I'm being very deliberate here to start. So I'm going to think of that little tilde, and then eventually I'll get rid of the tilde, and we'll never think of the tilde again. I just want to do this once, which is the fraction of individuals that are susceptible, infectious, and recovered. And so you see, wherever I see an S, I need to replace it with an S tilde and an n, right? Because we have the fraction and the total. So therefore, I should be able to write, and hopefully I don't screw this up. It's about looking at that side. OK. OK, something like that. That looks like I didn't mess it up. 
As you can see, eliminate, 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 I have ends everywhere that I can get rid of. Does everyone see that? Good. So now I can rewrite this as simply s tilde dot is minus beta s tilde i tilde i tilde dot is beta s tilde i tilde and r tilde dot minus gamma i is gamma i tilde. And we'll never speak of the tildes again. We're just going to call those s and i. I'm going to use them as fractions from now on. But I just wanted you to see that, in fact, you can reduce this from this model in terms of a population into one in which we think about fractions. OK? Is this clear how I did this sequence of moves? And you're used to doing such moves. And in fact, we could do even other moves, which is to make this dimensionless in terms of time, right? rescaling out the time. And in some ways, if we rescaled out the time, is something happening? Oh. Ah, yes. High quality chalk. Thank you. Excellent. I'm not just the last person to use the prior chalks. OK. Good. So now we have the model that we're going to play with. And maybe I'll just put it over here so I don't get rid of it. OK, I'm just going to keep that there as a reference. That in this rescaled model, because I only need to keep track of two things, not three things, all I need to know is that we have infections which go into the i category, and then they recover. I don't need to know r, because I have s plus i plus r is 1. OK? So I'll hold on to that. And now I'm going to go back and say, what is our initial condition? Our initial condition in this space of the fraction of individuals who are infected and the fraction of individuals who are susceptible and so on is 1 comma 0. Everyone is susceptible. No one is infected. And then we can ask the question, what happens? What happens when we have a small perturbation? We introduce a very, 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 very small fraction of infectious individuals, maybe just one. So epsilon is the order of 1 over n. n is a big number. Epsilon is very small. OK? So what we know to do, this is a nonlinear system of differential equations. What we know we're supposed to do formally, and obviously I've given you intuition, but I want to do the formal stuff a little today just to make it coincide, is we should linearize near fixed point. And we know that the procedure there is to linearize the nonlinear system, calculate the Jacobian, find the eigenvalues, and see if any of them are positive. And if they are, that implies that the infection would take off. OK? So we can calculate this Jacobian by examining those equations. And notice that if we take the derivative of the first, that f, and if I call the first one f of s comma i and the second one g of s comma i, then I can take the derivative with respect to s, and I'm left with minus beta i, and here minus beta s, and here beta i, and here beta s minus gamma. Which we need to evaluate at the fixed point, 1 comma 0, which becomes 0 minus beta, 0 beta minus gamma. OK? Now, in order to find the eigenvalues, then formally speaking, I brought my own 
method today to wet this thing. See, I'm getting experience in such matters. So I can efficiently erase. Anyone know, can you look at that? I'm just starting to erase here. I have these notes written down as well, so I also will give you a PDF copy of the notes. It won't be, on, it won't be horizontal, it'll be vertical, but nonetheless you'll get it. I'm going to keep going unless anyone has questions about this. Okay. I'll race half at a time and then move to the next. So you can see that what we need to be doing is calculating the determinant of J minus lambda times the identity matrix, setting that equal to zero and finding the values. But you don't need me to do that. You can read them off, right? Because if I put a minus lambda, minus lambda there, this zero means that I can just read off the eigenvalues from the diagonal, OK? So what are they? It's clear that lambda 1 is 0, and lambda 2 is beta minus gamma. Okay. Now, the question is, how do we interpret these eigenvalues? Right. Keeping in mind that we think that this is supposed to be some small perturbation where this is some small, right? It's some small perturbation u s and u i. So we have some small perturbation that is linearized. And so it's growing exponentially or not growing exponentially or decaying exponentially. So what are the interpretations of these two things? Remember that we made a perturbation and we think something may change, perhaps positively or negatively. Something is zero. What does the zero mean? Does, I know it means not changing. So there's no, the perturbation doesn't change. But what is that perturbation that wouldn't change? S. S. OK. So let me go back. And let me maybe draw the following. S, 1, 1, I, line, can't go. Here's your initial position. What is the perturbation that's going to lead to no change? You said S. What do you mean by S? I, I think you're right, but I just want to know what exactly. Along, Along the axis. So if we did 1 minus epsilon and stayed at 0, rather than putting that epsilon there, there would be no change. What does that really mean? We can really think of this as 1 minus epsilon, 0 epsilon in the full system. Susceptible, infected, recovered. How do we do that biologically? How do we just move the S into the R category? A vaccine. Right. So in some sense, this 0 eigenvalue is vaccination. When we vaccinate, we're moving the system along this x-axis, which turned out to be very important later. Right now, I'm dealing with a small perturbation. But you can see I can make arbitrary large perturbations. And it also wouldn't change the system, because I still have i equals 0. Okay, So it's true for small. This one has this feature. I know there's, when I went to see Tosca, I also had an obstructed view. So feel free to move around. There's a whole bunch of unobstructed views in the front row. Mateo appreciates that. Mateo is in the front row. He has an unobstructed view. OK, if you want to move to the front row, that's fine. So we can also think about this in terms, let's go back to this particular case, where if we wanted to actually see and calculate the eigenvector associated with the zero eigenvalue, we could go back and ask, if I take j, which you see is 0 minus beta 0, no, yes, beta minus gamma, and subtract a 0 eigenvalue from it, and say, where does this happen? Right, I've subtracted the 0 and multiplied by 0 on the right side. 
you can see that I have to hit something which is going to be seeing this side unless this value has a zero in it. So it's something with a zero. The only way to satisfy this equation for some eigenvector is if that second component is zero. OK, so I'm just giving you this sort of algebraic way, but really the intuition is that this is a vaccination. OK, that's one. So this is A, the vaccine route. What about B? The lambda is beta minus gamma, which you see, obviously, we would already talked about this. We have a condition, and this is lambda 2. Where was lambda 1? Right, is 0. We already did that. You can see this is just gamma of beta over gamma minus 1, which is just equal to r naught minus 1 over the characteristic time of being infected. OK? When the transmission rate exceeds the recovery rate, you get takeoff. So we have a threshold criteria. And the threshold criteria can be written in terms of the basic reproduction number. We have a time scale because this also, we think of this as the speed and this as the strength. This basic reproduction number will characterize how strong the disease is. Transmissibility is at the individual level. If it's greater than one, then we have a positive speed and we have takeoff. And this perturbation, Obviously, I'm moving things along this axis. And then something is going to happen. And it will cue so close there. That's not realistic. And somehow we know that it's going to land somewhere here. But of course, it might have landed there. It might even land it over there. It won't land over there in the corner for various reasons that I will unpack again today, even though I talked about it. And just to remind folks, and this may be something I'll do later in the week. But we have this recovery rate gamma, which means that if I ask you what's the probability that you're still infectious after some time t, and here's t, here's 0, you're definitely still infectious at the start. And this is an exponential whose mean time is ti. Everyone can see that? And in that period, there's a sort of a rate. And so I need to multiply because that's a constant rate. Then you can see why if I have a rate of transmission beta, right, I'm going to have on average beta times the period of new infections, which is why we have this r naught, and which is why when that's greater than 1, we get spread. I'm filling in, this in, in all the details for which I sort of went through quickly. And hopefully now, this is making sure you get it. Questions about this part? In the back. Question? Probability that you're still infectious after time t. The question was, for those watching at home, what is that y-axis? I know it's, it's probability of still being infectious after time t given a recovery rate gamma. It's exponential. Tomorrow, I might talk about different kind of generation interval distributions where first you go through an exposed period, then you go through an infectious period. So the probability of being infected, not infectious, but the probability of being that you're still infected may not necessarily have this shape anymore. And the, certainly the probability of being infectious doesn't have that shape. Right? So if you have to go through two stages, then clearly at the beginning, the probability you're infectious, which is different than being infected is probably near 0. And only later it goes up, right? So, And then for if I did the probability, anyway, you, you can see why they could have different kind of shapes. So let me do that more tomorrow. So we have that as our initial criteria. All that tells us is whether or not there is some sort of takeoff. And if there is takeoff, then some sort of dynamic unfolds. Okay. 
And we expect the dynamic with time. This is population fraction. And here, 1, here, 0. I'm going to draw this is going to be S. And here, I. And here, R. And I've tried to make these two gaps the same. Because S plus I plus R is 1. And at the end, there are no infected. The epidemic is over. Therefore, whoever hasn't been infected, right? there's still a few fraction. That's the gap between 1 minus R is whoever's left at the end. OK. I talked about this yesterday, but I want to now unpack it again slowly and deliberately. We showed there was a takeoff. The criteria for whether this happens as opposed to decline is whether or not the transmissibility is greater than the recovery rate. The transmission rate greater than the recovery rate. In other words, R not greater than 1. There is another condition here where I dot is 0. You will notice at this point still a lot of people get infected because it is not precipitously I equals 0. It's I dot equals 0. And I'm going to explain in this lecture why the herd immunity threshold is a very important concept if we vaccinate. And it's a very dangerous concept if we let natural infections do their thing, really for two reasons. One of which is that natural infections come with consequences. And second of which, the herd immunity threshold in an active infection is not the end of the epidemic, whereas it is in concept and theory when there's a, vac a vaccination. So when you pass it one way or another, you have very different outcomes, which I will try to elaborate on. How can we find this point? Well, we recall, because I wrote it over there, beta si minus gamma i is equal to 0, which implies when s of t is equal to gamma over beta, or 1 over r naught, then we're at a point where the number of susceptibles has been depleted. So the herd immunity threshold happens when we have susceptible, susceptible depletion. The amount of susceptible depletion that we need depends on the intrinsic strength of the disease. The stronger disease, the more susceptibles must be depleted before we reach this point. So for example, if R0 is 2, we need to get to a half. Right? R0 3, 1 third, 4, 1, and so on. So in other words, susceptibles have to get lower and lower. And you can also think about this a different way. Because if I were to think about this speed and not set it to 0, but write it as gamma beta over gamma, sorry, gamma i beta s of t minus 1, you would see that I could write R effective is R naught times S of T. Everyone see that equivalence? So really what this is saying is that we start with this basic reproductive number in time because of susceptible depletion, although on average, and I've already erased it, but remember I say I contact with a certain number of people, a fraction are susceptible. That's reducing the effective strength of the disease over time. And when that effective strength gets to 1, we're at a replacement value. And if we're at a replacement value, then we no longer go up. And soon after the next few people get infected, we start to go down. Any questions about that? I see some puzzled faces, so maybe there's a question. 
No? OK. Fine. Now we've explained that concept. So now I want to go through and just explain again where we end up. Good. We're getting almost getting some good major concepts and getting the foundations here set. So now we've shown if we have 1, 0, and we go to 1 minus epsilon, epsilon, we have an outbreak when r naught is greater than 1, which means now we have to go to 1 over r naught i star r star, meaning we hit that herd immunity threshold. Right? There's still the other kinds around, so I'm not going to set Oh, I don't know why I wrote star. I h i t. So we get to a herd immunity threshold. It's not an equilibrium. Sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to imply that. And then after that, with time, we get to s infinity 0 r infinity. I just want to go through these sort of sequences of moves. Right? These are the sort of landmarks in the classic kind of models. And all this seems highly simplified. This is precisely the sort of mindset of how some of these early models in 2020 were operating, showing these sort of single epidemic curves, susceptible depletion, and also why when people saw things that went up and down, they not just Political leaders who weren't trained, but even some folks in this space said, well, it went up and down, so therefore we're on the other side of this. And inevitably, we're going to go here and stay there. Right? Tomorrow, I will talk about ways in which we don't necessarily need to have that happen, but I need for you to even see the comparison. I need to walk through all these steps first and reinforce it. OK. So. We now can go back to this diagram I've already drawn. And you can see that it's going to go somewhere. Where is it going to go? Well, I've already made the claim that it's not all going to the same place. For example, it could be that all these flows somehow got trapped and moved into the corner. There were still some lingering infections. And by the end, no one was left susceptible. In fact, you'll see some articles out nowadays like, why is it that some people haven't been infected with COVID? Obviously, vaccines is a big part, and that reduces likelihood. But even in these simple models, there, even for a disease that has a relatively high R0, we still expect that some people haven't been infected, in part in structured populations, it could be that a whole group hasn't been infected. But it's more likely that, in fact, someone got lucky, people around them were infected, and now most of the people they interact with have recovered, and they're sort of buffering the risk. It's very hard for the disease to reach them, because it has to cross through all these other interactions with people who were already either vaccinated or infected and recovered, or maybe both. And I should also point out that, you know, the, it's clear for all of us now have a lived experience with COVID. So I'm writing stuff on the board, but you have your own internal sense. And we also know, I'll get into in a moment, that the vaccines in some cases are not perfect. Right? And also, if you're young, you aren't even eligible for a vaccine. And if you're a parent like me and have a couple kids who go to a French public school, your whole family probably got infected at some point late last year. Right? Even if you were vaccinated or doubly vaccinated. I'll get back to some of those ideas. That was a bit of diversion. So let me go and figure out how do we figure out where we're going to go. We have liftoff. And I asked you to do this, but I went a little quickly. I'm going to do it again anyway. I realize I'm doing things twice, but that's OK. Some of you, this is the first time you're hearing it. If I look at those equations, and then I write how much is there a change in septal for every change in infected, you can see. I don't know why I've decided to do it that way. That's annoying. It's clear that I want to do it that way so I can cancel things. You can see that I should get something like minus 1 plus gamma over beta s. Good. And so you can see that I could turn this into di 
equals ds negative 1 plus gamma over beta s. And I could take the integral of both sides, and I would get i equals minus s plus log of s divided by r naught plus some constant. And you would see that initially, when s at the beginning is 1 and i is 0, we have 0 equals minus 1 plus 0 plus a constant. One. As I said, unobstructed seats available in the first row. All day. Next lecture, too, probably going to be available. This is my initial condition. Now I want to solve for the end. At the end, i is also 0, which is convenient, but now s is not. So you can see that if i is 0 at the end, we get something like s infinity. Let me see how I like to write it. That's fine. Minus 1 times r naught equals log of s infinity. For every value of r naught, there is going to be a unique solution to that, which is why I drew this and not them all converging there. This is the final size relationship. It says there's a speed. If the speed is positive, or really I should say the strength is greater than 1, the speed is positive, we hit the herd immunity threshold, we eventually go to here, and the strength is determining both whether or not it takes off and how big the disease gets. But as I showed you yesterday, there's not a unique relationship between strength and speed. There's a unique relationship between strength and size. OK. Any questions about this part? Fine. Now that I've set all of this up, I can ask the question in a different way. Here's where it went. And you'll also notice that this s infinity is obviously larger. Ah, ah, I was thinking of it. Is obviously smaller. It, obviously, insane statement I was just about to make, which I caught myself because I was in my mind thinking about the recovered people. This is obviously less than 1 over r naught, right? So we first hit the herd immunity threshold, and then we went down and got even lower. Whew. Glad I avoided that perilous mistake. Now, I want to talk about how we stop things. This is what happens if the disease goes unchecked in a population. Any questions before I start to erase? This is one of the days where we go like through six boards. It's one of those six boards days. It's OK. It hasn't actually been that challenging. You're sort of, it's just a flow right now. It'll get a little more challenging in a moment. Any questions before I race? OK. Yes, no, otherwise I'm erasing and I'm talking about vaccines. No, it's not a very stupid question. Is it called finite, finite size? Because of final, final. Sorry, I'm wearing a mask. The final size relationship, F-I-N-A-L. No, 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 OK. No, no problem. Yes. So we have this final size relationship. And also, I will, for those who are at home, I, will, I have a PDF of these notes. It's not quite what I'm doing, but it's close enough, and I will share. Good. OK. Good. OK. We mentioned vaccines are here. Let me erase two boards, and then I'll pick up in a moment. Good. This is what happens if things are not stopped. So now let's go back to our original idea, because we've figured out the herd immunity threshold. We figured out this final size of the epidemic. Implicitly, it relates to strength. But we might not have just waited for that outcome. Maybe we took some proactive step 
and there was vaccinations. So let's imagine that we did this move, 1 minus the fraction vaccinated, 0 fraction vaccinated. So I'm going to write it in the full SIR context so you see it. Will there be an outbreak? Here, I'll pause. Will there be an outbreak? Postgraduate ICTB diploma students. Will there be an outbreak in this theoretical case that I've just unpacked? If you're not sure, tell me how you might even figure out if there's supposed to be an outbreak. I will point out that this question, there's some people saying no, some people saying yes. My impression, if I were sitting in your chairs, I would think, oh, this lecture hasn't been that hard that now. And now I've asked the question, like, oh, wait a second. I'm not as confident in my answer. So let me, it's a little trickier, more subtle. I saw someone shake their head. Is any, was that a no in the back? You don't think there'll be an outbreak? Yes, you don't think there's going to be an outbreak, or no, you don't? Which one? No outbreak. OK. What happens if I vaccinate a very tiny fraction of individuals, something like epsilon? What happens if the fraction that I vaccinate is very small, like epsilon? Let me explain. You agree that I can write it in this SI plane, 1, 1, line, can't be there. And this, depending on how big I make my FV, denotes how many fractions I've vaccinated. If FV is 1, then I go all the way down there. I haven't said FV was 1. I could also vaccinate a very tiny number of folks over there. Do you think there would be an outbreak if I vaccinate a very small number of individuals? Uh, as long as we don't have uh, infected people, we shouldn't have uh, an outbreak. Right. Now, an infected individual shows up in the population. Sorry, I wasn't being, uh, I was implicitly assuming that yes, we first vaccinate and then somehow there's an infection that shows up. Sorry, I wasn't clear. Okay. Now you probably are more concerned about this outbreak if I have yeah, a small number. Should, maybe there is a threshold. But maybe there's a threshold. Okay. So the question is, it's not just that I vaccinate some people. I have to vaccinate a lot of people. Clearly, if I vaccinate an infinitesimal number of people and there's an infection, it's, at least theoretically, I think you can feel that it's not going to stop the outbreak. I'm about to show you that this suggestion of a threshold is the right intuition. What I'm trying to say is that if you vaccinate a very, very small number of people and an infected person shows up in this theoretical model, you expect an outbreak. If I vaccinate everyone, it's pretty clear there won't be an outbreak by definition. The question is, do I have to vaccinate everyone to stop the outbreak? Or is there a threshold? Is there some point somewhere where there is no longer an outbreak? So the answer is yes. Let's go find it. So let's now think about this dynamic and recall that when we, remember when we did the linearization on the fixed point, and we're going to start near this fixed point. Remember, this is a fixed point of the dynamic. Any value along this line is a fixed point. I haven't said if it's stable or not, but it's certainly a fixed point, which means I can calculate the Jacobians and I can calculate my two eigenvalues. One of them was 0 by definition. I vaccinate some more people. I don't have any change, which is, I think, what you were assuming in terms of your notion of there's not an outbreak. But there's also a second eigenvalue. And if you recall, this was beta times s initial minus gamma. I had replaced that value with 1 because that was our initial condition. But if I vaccinate people, then this becomes 
beta 1 minus F V minus gamma. Right? Because there are fewer susceptible people, which you can even think of this in terms of the probability that I run to that susceptible person and stops being 1, but rather 1 minus F. Okay? Which means I can write this as gamma R naught 1 minus FV minus 1. There is now a new effective strength which has been reduced because of the vaccines. The condition for an outbreak, outbreak happens when R naught 1 minus FV is greater than 1. Or when 1 minus FV is greater than 1 over R naught, or FV What have I done wrong? Yes. Yes, good. No, I, I'm, I'm doing it right. This is the outbreak condition. And our control condition is simply Fv greater than 1 minus 1 over R0. I just want to make sure I was uh, saying the right words in the right conditional order. Thank you. You saw where my brain was going. OK? If I want to control things, then I have to vaccinate, and I can write this as R0 minus 1 over R0. And I'll write it higher. Control when the vaccination is greater or than R0 minus 1 over R0. Let me now draw what that looks like. If I have a disease with a certain strength, R0, and I'm only going to be interested in those that would take off anyway in the absence of vaccines. And I ask, what's my critical vaccination threshold? And I write 2 and 3 and 4 and 1 and 1 half, and I draw that, and 1 third, I draw as 2 thirds, and three quarters, and I draw things here, I will get a shape like that. The stronger the disease is, the more that I have to vaccinate in order to stop things. What does that mean, though, here, in terms of this diagram? What it means is that there is a value, and I just also, I want you to Recognize one thing before I say that. Does anyone feel like they've seen this term 1 minus 1 over 0, R0 before in this lecture? Where have you seen 1 minus 1 over R0 before? It was like two, one and a half blackboards ago. And we integrated the, the S in the I. Uh, someone is speaking from the internet. Can you repeat what you're going to say? I just couldn't hear it. Just repeat it, please. Or type it. When we integrated. Yes, but actually even before when we integrated, because we got a bunch of other stuff, do you recall that there was a herd immunity threshold when S was 1 over R0? Right? When we had reduced it to that much. Which means that the cumulative number of infections was 1 minus 1 over R0. In other words, we got to the herd immunity threshold where the infection was at its replacement value when that many people had already been infected. Vaccination, right? This is essentially herd immunity threshold via vaccination. It's the same thing, the same value.
but we get it in a safer, more ethical way, you could argue. Because there are two things that happen there. First of all, at this value, yes, just like the herd immunity threshold value, then we expect I dot to be 0. But remember, in an outbreak, we cross these points when we had a lot of infected people around. We cross this value up here, up high. And then it goes down like this, and goes down like this. But in fact, if we ever get down over here, these are all stable parts of that fixed point line. And these are unstable. If we don't vaccinate enough, we get smaller outbreaks. But if we vaccinate enough, then not only are we at this kind of critical value, this herd immunity threshold, which happens right here. This is this critical vaccination point. But because our eye is so small, then we don't have any of this epidemic overshoot. We don't first see a lot of infected people, and then it turns around. We just turn it around. Is everyone, that's an important concept. So in other words, if the disease unfolds, then yes, at a certain point it starts turning around once we have had a lot of people infected. But there's even more people infected. Remember, S infinity is less than S herd immunity threshold. In other words, there are more infections even after that point. But if we vaccinate, then basically we don't get any new infections. We just stay near that line, in other words, the cumulative number of infections is basically zero to first order. OK. This is almost done with some of the foundational concepts. I just have a, a few more things to go, and then I'm going to switch to heterogeneity. I'm on track here. Any questions about this? So when people we're talking about the equivalency between natural infection and natural immunity and vaccination-derived immunity. I want to point out again two reasons. First of all, the safety and health risks of being infected with COVID-19, especially in older individuals, but for all ages, so much greater than whenever incredibly small risk. And there are some people who are, you know, have some medical reasons that they shouldn't or can't be vaccinated. But you would much rather get your immunity through a vaccine, you as an individual. And as a population, in order for us to get to that point where we have that herd immunity threshold, then a lot of people have to be sick and a lot of bad consequences. Whereas, if we can go this way rather than that way, we end up not getting all this other infection. So it has both the population, the individual protection helps the individual, but it also helps the population as a whole. It also says why you don't have to vaccinate the whole population, but you have to vaccinate a lot for you to see the immunity benefits, right? This notion of a herd immunity benefit. The more likely it is for disease to spread, the more you have to push this to the left. And why vaccine coverage, which is really what this FV is about, becomes so important. OK? So good. We've explained those concepts. There's one more board I want to do on basic stuff. So I'm about to raise the board yet again. Any questions? Otherwise, I'm going ahead and erasing. OK. Good. We got this. We got this. It's a nice diagram. Hopefully, you have it, because it's going away. off the whole board because I want to do just one more thing. I'm even going to erase this corner because I want to do one more thing there. And just to, as a reference, let me 
make sure I'm using the same thing. Okay. So now I want to talk about another sort of basic concept, and then I will move into things that I think for most of you will not be familiar, but I just want to establish this last idea. We have been talking about S, I, R models in which there is some transmission rate beta, some recovery rate gamma, but now we could add some loss of immunity alpha. Okay? And it's becoming increasingly clear that this applies also to SARS-CoV-2. It certainly applies to things like cold and flu. And you can think of this as either or both the effect that the immune system has some memory, but maybe there's waning antibody levels. And even though you have memory, uh, T cells and B cells, still maybe it's not sterilizing, you can get infected again. It also could be the case that the disease itself is changing. So what we ascribe to waning immunity is because now the target is different because of some sort of antigenic drift or shift. And even though I'm not talking about all the multi-strain components, effectively what we see is some loss of immunity. If we do this, then we can write this full kind of model over there, which I'll explain in a second. I'm not sure if I necessarily need to. I might skip it, but I will explain a simplified model which is imagine now that this alpha is so fast that we're even going to ignore that other component for a moment. I'll explain the full, maybe I'm just trying to figure out how I really need to do it. The concepts are very similar, so I might skip. Imagine we take a model in which rather than having this immune period, we have beta, but when people recover, they immediately become uh, susceptible again. And you can think of this as the limit in some sense of this alpha being very fast. And we could do that too, but well, I don't know. It, it might be a little bit boring. Nonetheless, I want to analyze this model now. And just to ask the question, well, what's going to happen in this case? Versus this case where we saw an epidemic when we didn't have this. Something else could happen here. We still can have the notion of an outbreak, but our equilibrium may not be the same anymore. So let's again do our playbook, which is we start near 1, 0, and we imagine that we introduce a small perturbation. And we can then analyze the dynamics and ask, well, what are the linearized system near this fixed point? And you can read it off up there if actually now, oh, I, did, I never even wrote down the equations, which that wasn't nice of me. This would be a version with no immunity. Good. Sorry for not writing the equations. You can see that this would be minus beta i, and here is minus beta s plus gamma. Here is beta i, and then beta, what? Yes, beta s minus gamma, which we evaluate at this fixed point, and we end up getting 0, 0, the same sort of terms as before, such that we read off Lambda 1 is 0, and lambda 2 is beta minus gamma. Now this, of course, I have to be a little bit tricky here, because in fact, this is actually only one equation, because I have s plus i is equal to 1. So I'm being, I shouldn't have even done this. I should have reduced it to just one system of equations, but that's okay. So I want to focus on this for the moment and just point out that, again, you have an outbreak for the same reasons as before when R0 
which is beta over gamma is greater than 1, in the SI model, we get an outbreak. But our equilibrium is different. Because now, in fact, they're just the same equation. We have S star is 1 over R naught. And therefore, I star must be 1 minus 1 over R naught. So in this situation, what we have with time is susceptibles going down, infecteds going up, S, I. And the addition of these two must always be 1 so that we have a speed of beta minus gamma, a strength of R0, and a size of R0 minus 1 over R0. And we have an endemic state rather than an epidemic where something goes up and down. And you've probably heard a lot about endemic transitions because we clearly are not eliminating SARS-CoV-2 anytime soon. And some people talk about endemic as if it's a good thing. Oh, it's endemic. It's just around. There are a lot of bad things that can stick around for a long time. So I would just caution that, especially if we don't mitigate or do anything to prevent it or don't vaccinate or can't treat or so on, these outcomes can also be bad. They're just perpetual. They're just not something that goes up and down, and they depend somewhat on the duration of immunity. If we added a vaccinated class here, which people often do, you can imagine I could have turned this and added a V class, and maybe some people went here, and some people went there. And you can imagine making more and more of such assumptions. But if there's loss of immunity, then generically what you're going to find is that there is a risk of reaching an endemic state. There's only one other caveat I want to add there, which is that these kind of models, even if I were to add the loss of immunity, tend to converge to a fixed point. But let me ask something about when I write this minus alpha r term, and I ask the question, here's time. What's the probability that you're still immune after time t? What is that shape based on my model that I've written there? I've, I've asked a version of this question like 10 times in the, in the last couple of weeks, and I feel like I should put that on the exam just to make sure you definitely know it. If I've written such a model where I have a probability per unit time of losing immunity, what's the probability I'm still immune after time t? Exponential, e to the minus alpha t. And it doesn't actually go to zero. That's not what exponentials do. You get it. If you all recall, remember I derived that I said if I have a rate of something happening, then 1 minus alpha times t, I have to raise it to a power, and I get the exponential out. Anytime you see. These first order processes, just like a radioactive decay process, you have a resonancy time that's exponential. Does that seem realistic to you? Do you expect that most people who recover are immediately infectable again, susceptible again? No. So it is possible that we could have done something like R minus I won't change this. Let me, let me just change it. So if I have r dot is gamma i minus alpha r, it implies that. I could have written like r dot is gamma i minus gamma i t minus tau. I could have written like a delay differential equation that says exactly tau ago. It lasts for six months. Your immunity, and then six months later, boom, you're, in fa you're susceptible again. Because the individuals who came in tau ago, that's the new rate in, are now popping out. You're losing them at that time. So because of the delay, I don't write the R, because that's the current value. It's actually the rate of new recoveries tau ago that then leave tau in the future. 
So if I were to write this as a delay differential equation, I would write it like that, which means the probability that I'm immune would go like that and then that. It would be a step function downwards. Does that seem realistic? Also no. Probably it's something like that, right? Some smoother thing. So just to point out, if you ever get into this business, that what people often do, sometimes they do this, and I'll talk about generation intervals more tomorrow, but what they often do is say, there's an S, I, and then R1, R2, R3. They make a bunch of intermediate states, what is called the linear chain trick. And what you do in some sense is you increase the rate of moving from each one of these states. So if I have alpha and I had n such states, I would make each transition go n times alpha. So I'd go through n states but n times as fast, preserving the duration. But instead of making it like this, I would have it now, the probability it lasts a certain time would be modal and the probably that I haven't, I'm still immune, would have now a curve shape. Okay, so there are, I won't go through all this, just to let you know that these choices have some biological consequences. And if you make these kind of choices, then in fact you could get potentially oscillations in an epidemic model. Because what happens, especially if there's new bursts of individuals who are vulnerable, you get an epidemic wave, there's recovery, there's still some infections going around, but then later all, out pop a whole bunch of new susceptible people. And that can lead to drive another oscillation as we have waves of new vulnerable people. And that is increasingly clear part of the story of SARS-CoV-2 as well. The waning immunity is part of the story. And it's not an exponentially distributed waning immunity. OK. That is my effort at foundations. Any questions before I start to move into some new territory? for the last 30 minutes or so. OK. Good. Very nice. We've covered a lot of material, but I don't think we've rushed it. We haven't moved too slow. We haven't moved too fast. It's, I hope it's a Goldilocks level of information. So we'll see. I want to do. One more module here at the end. Yes? Oh, I've erased everything, but you have a question. Uh, yeah, in previous lectures, you write that also for solving the same issue, um, you add an exponential term, uh, like B, the parameter ah. depends on. Yeah. In the prior lectures, you're referencing, I think, the fact that in the viral ecology model, I had a delay differential equation, but there was something like e to the minus omega tau. That's what you were referencing. Yeah. The question is, why in my viral ecology models did I have a time delay with an e to the minus omega tau term? And here I did not. The reason, let me explain the answer, the answer to that question. Then if you have another question, just because people might be listening and want to know, in the chemostat model, that delay was the latent period. But it had to be discounted by the fact that the cells in the chemostat might have been lost in the intermediate period. So in order to do the delay differential equation, I had to reduce the amount of lysis by a factor e to the minus omega tau, where omega was the loss rate and tau was the latent period. Here, there's no way for the, I haven't included a death term or any other thing. So I'm assuming that everyone survives the infection and then later comes back, so that term is 1. And that's why I don't see an exponential there. OK. So Good. this exponential will not be physically visible. That's the, or physically uh, achievable, the, this it, term, right? That, in this the, case, where I have an SIR model, then I'm thinking people became recovered now. Now, if, for, for example, this period of of immunity was super long, that I worried about demographics, then yes, I would not just put all of the people who, 
recovered 20 years ago back into the septal pool. I have to worry about demography and deaths for other reasons, and I have to discount it. On this time scale, I'm ignoring births and deaths. I ignore that discounting. We can talk about it later at the break if that's confusing. OK? But that's Thank why you. I don't include that term. OK. I want to now wrap up with one choose your own adventure concept and talk about heterogeneity. And the stuff I'm going to talk about today, you can find, and I will post on Slack. Some of it, though, obviously it's not done in, the in always the same pedagogical ways, in Rose et al., Journal of Theoretical Biology, 2021, and that has a lot of other references. But I will be following some of that methodology. And to do this, I want to first start with a simplified model. I'm going to draw, just to have this in mind, imagining that I take my S population and break them down into two categories, S low and S high. And the L and the H denote the fact that these individuals are less likely to be infected, and these are more likely to be infected. The reasons could be intrinsic, they could be behavioral, they could be a combination. And so you can imagine that contacts between I and SL, this might happen at some rate beta L, and this beta, and in fact I'll do it beta times epsilon L, epsilon high, and then I'll have recovery. And I won't worry, once people are infected, I'll assume they have essentially the same infection. You could imagine writing down a model like this. This is one way to break a symmetry to introduce some heterogeneity. And I had some lecture notes where I went through this two-class model. But I actually find it a little bit easier to do a large number. I just want to show you that if you can agree with me this is possible, I could introduce three classes or four, or really a very large number of classes. OK? And before I even get started, right, I want to point out that it's possible I can choose the epsilon low and epsilon high so that the average infectivity was the same in the homogeneous model. Right? I could choose it so that I have a proportion of lows and highs and different vulnerabilities that we basically seem like we should have the same dynamics. But these are nonlinear systems. And I just want to ask people even before I start, if I were initially to have the same amount of less likely to be infected and more likely to be infected individuals, and I look forward in time, do you think that in the future we'd have the same number of SL and SI? Everyone understands my question? I start with 50-50 split of the SL and S high. In the future, do we still have a 50-50 split? You're saying some no's. OK, so people are already building intuition. Someone I haven't heard from, why no in the second row? Why, why no? Simply because in the end, we will have more SH than SL because the, no, the opposite. The opposite. Yes. Correct. Because the people that are more likely to be infected will not be, um, will be infected. Correct. So the intuition here is that if we have a higher rate of infection, then these individuals will probably be infected first, which means there'll be fewer, relatively speaking, here than here. And now you can imagine I could add a twist. Imagine that in a world of just SLs, there's no outbreak, because it's actually not enough to drive the outbreak. They're alone. There are not is less than one. And here, this one is greater than one. What you can see then, intuitively, there's a possibility that if this is depleted first, the outbreak itself could stop earlier, because the individuals 
who are more likely to be affected get infected early, leaving only these and actually leading to a slowing down. Right? I haven't written any equations, but I'm just asking you to sort of think intuitively what might happen. And if you want to, you can try this little two-state model and prove to yourself that, in fact, that's what's, what's going to happen. But it gets a little bit algebraically eh, not, as, not that nice. And I want to just take that intuition and actually build it up a bit more formal. Right? So this intuition that if you have a higher vulnerability to infection, the person is out more, interacting more, they're the ones likely to be infected first, depleting the population in some sense if people's actions are fixed. There's a lot of caveats here. Right? If they're fixed, if they're not, then we just resupply. Right? So you can imagine, the, unfortunately, the cash register during early COVID, the person in the front line interacting with a lot of people. If they got sick, you put another person there, and you're just moving people from S low to S high all the time, fueling more infections. What I want to start with is just the consequences of heterogeneity. Then we can talk later and maybe even have a discussion about what that could mean. So what I want to now do is imagine that I take this population, S, and divide it into categories which I'll call epsilon. And each one of these categories is going to have an intrinsic vulnerability so that I can write, instead of the standard way, I can write something, and in fact, I shouldn't, I'm not going to end up doing any movement, so I'll just write it that way. Each one of these can you think of as a little bin, minus beta, and I'm going to assume that I've used these vulnerabilities that's just going to scale the overall rate. You can deal with other sort of monotonic assumptions. I'm going to assume that this variable denotes how it scales the intrinsic transmissibility. This is a subpopulation. It's interacting with infected individuals. And so therefore, I'm going to write something like that, an infinite number of these. I can imagine a finite number and then turn it into a continuum such that, that the new infected must be the integral beta epsilon right okay so what I have is a system of equations that describes not just one group of susceptible individuals, but a spectrum. And now I want to establish a few ground rules here. I'm going to assume that initially integral the epsilon S0 of epsilon is equal to 1. So initially, I'm going to assume everyone is susceptible. But I'm also going to claim that over time, this can decrease. So I shouldn't think of S of epsilon as a probability distribution, because it doesn't integrate to 1. But rather, if I integrate it, the norm, the sort of magnitude of the probability mass in this distribution is equal to the fraction that are susceptible. So it's less than or equal to 1. Given this, I can also do another definition, just to kind of get some definitions in order. I can ask the question, what is the average vulnerability in this population, right, which is going to scale this attack rate? Well, if I want to take the average in the population, then it seems like I should take this integral of epsilon times s of epsilon. But remember, this is not, by definition, a probability distribution, so I need to do that. In other words, this is integral d epsilon, epsilon, s of epsilon over s. And I will try to, I know that I'm using S in two ways. 
One is a big one, one is a little one. That's not so satisfying. I probably should call it n sub s, but I'm going to do it that way. Whenever I want it to be the distribution, I'll put it of epsilon. OK. So you can see that we have this distribution of vulnerabilities or susceptibilities, and we have an average vulnerability in the population. Yes? On time, yes, absolutely. It's of time, because this time, time, they're dependent on time. They're changing in time. In fact, this is what I want you all to think about. Imagine that we started with some distribution. Epsilon, S of epsilon, and this was the initial value. The question is, what does the infection process do? Well, I would claim that if this were some feature unrelated to the rate of infection, then all the infection process does is drop all of this down. Right? It would just move it down because different categories, there's some other feature unrelated to infection. Infection just removes individuals at a rate independent of this epsilon. But this epsilon tells me something about the scaling of the attack rate, which means, in fact, these are bigger rates. Does anyone see what I'm trying to do here? I'm trying to multiply those arrows by epsilon. And if that's the case, then over time, this might evolve to something that looks like that. And if I were to draw the shadow of where it was before, it's moving down and to the left, which is what your intuition was when I just had the two. right? But here I have this full distribution. OK. Everyone with me still? I have written somewhere here a system of equations, which now I'm going to write back here because I like them to stay because they're an important reference. So we had this two state one. I gave you some intuition, though I didn't do any of the math behind it. And now I'm writing something like ds of epsilon dt minus beta epsilon s of epsilon i. Remember, this is of t, t. i dot is just the accumulation of these infections. But it would be nice to write s dot. right? It would be nice to write it like this. We would like to know how are actually the susceptibles changing with time. OK? I'm going to start to erase the middle part of the board. I moved this over because I want to have it as a reference and collect stuff. So how do we do that? Everyone got this part? It's about to go away. And I'll get back to that in a moment. Was that a question? Where was I? OK, good. Let us write down s, which is the integral, the epsilon s of epsilon, such that s dot is integral d epsilon ds of epsilon dt, which is equal to the integral d epsilon minus beta epsilon s of epsilon i, which is equal to this minus beta i, the force of infection, times the integral d epsilon epsilon s of epsilon. But you should recognize this 
if I were to divide by s and multiply by s, so I've multiplied by 1, then this object is just the average vulnerability, which means that we actually get a macroscopic equation that is not just about how many individuals who are infected and susceptible have, but their average vulnerability to infection. Here, we might have started at 1, but now the average is less than 1. Right? Because if I say initially I'm going to assume the average is 1, because that's arbitrary, I could always stack it into beta, you can see that what's happening here is we're slowing down the infection rate. Because not only are there fewer people around to be infected, those who remain are less likely to be infected than those who were there at the present. Because the infection process sculpts this distribution. I'm using the word sculpt in terms of sculpture intentionally. Right? It's changing the shape in a certain way. Good. Now, why do we know this epsilon bar, if this epsilon bar were the same in time, if this didn't evolve, we'd be done. Right? So how do I know epsilon bar is definitely going to go down? I sort of, you feel it, but it would be nice to get a little bit better idea. Let us think for a moment about something that I mentioned very rapidly at the end, too rapidly probably. I want to denote epsilon d as being, or epsilon bar d, as being the average vulnerability of the next individual to be infected. We have a population. Someone's going to be infected next. What is their average, what is their value of epsilon? And if we take across all the different possibilities, we get this epsilon bar d. Okay. Well, we can formally write this, this draw average, as the integral the epsilon times epsilon times the probability that we draw something whose vulnerability is epsilon, right? And now I don't have to do the bottom integral because by definition I have a probability. But of course, I need to write the probability that my draw is epsilon as epsilon s of epsilon divided by the integral of epsilon s of epsilon, and by definition, therefore, the probability is a distribution that integrates to 1. Questions in the back? The average vulnerability of the next individual to be infected. This is sort of a draw. So remember, we have a distribution, but because we're drawing this distribution not at random, but with a probability that scales with epsilon, I'm more likely to choose from this side. So I'm trying to formally figure out what that is, how big that is. OK. And everyone sees why this is, if I don't have anyone in that class, I can't draw. But I draw them with a scale factor epsilon. So now I can rewrite this. And what I hope you can see is that if I write epsilon d bar, and actually, I think I'm just going to, it's getting too low on the board. So I like this sculpting. No, can you still see if I get this low? Uh, it gets to be a little tricky. I think I've talked about the sculpting enough so we know what that is. So we can write this average draw vulnerability, this epsilon bar d, as the integral E times epsilon squared, S of epsilon, divided by the integral of epsilon F of epsilon, which we can obviously 
right, S over S on top and bottom. If we write it like that, we get this is by just definition 1 over epsilon bar. And this, by definition, is just the average value of epsilon squared. But of course, you recall, variance is epsilon squared minus average value squared. Sorry, I'm getting a little squishy there. So we can write this as simply, let's see if I'm making sure I'm right. Yes, average value of epsilon squared over the average value of epsilon plus sigma squared over epsilon bar, which is just epsilon bar plus something. The draw is equal to the mean plus something related to the variance. In other words, as long as we have a distribution for the positive variance, right, we have a distribution that has some variability, the effect will be that the draw is greater than the average, which means we really are sculpting this distribution. We're not uniformly pulling it down. We're actually pulling more. And therefore, if we're depleting things that are on average higher than the average, we must be making the average lower. And we're decreasing the average susceptibility. I want to point out that if we had an exponential distribution where sigma squared is equal to epsilon bar squared, for an exponential, the average draw is two times the mean, the thing that I mentioned very rapidly in my lecture yesterday. That just happens to be, but for any general case, we see that we're actually going to be drawing more from the right. And therefore, when we go to this equation, we realize that this epsilon bar is also a function of time. And if we could figure that out, we might be able to re-examine what this macroscopic dynamic should look like. OK? This is board like number 10 today. OK. Can I move to the next idea? And I'm going to scan all this and give it to you as well. Can I try to, I want to wrap up this one idea today before we're running out of time. Any questions? Because I'm about to erase stuff. So just, yes. So from that equation from the average vulnerability of the next individual, it means that it increases over time, right? The average vulnerability of the next infected individual is higher than the mean. If I have some, I need to erase something. Let me sacrifice this part. If I have some current distribution, S, this is my current distribution, this is my mean. Somehow over here is where I'm going to tend to pull the next individual. It could be anywhere, but it will be tends to be to the right, which means that if I looked in the future, if I've pulled things from the right, my distribution mean must go to the left with time. And it keeps going to the left. So the average draw probability actually keeps going down with time because I'm pulling those who are more vulnerable than the average every time. OK? Good. So now, we have written this, which I can now erase, because now I'm interested. I've convinced you, I hope, that epsilon bar is not a constant. As long as there's variability, it will change and it actually will decrease because of this mechanism. Right? Because I'm hitting this with some other feature, which pulls the average to the right. So now I actually can look at this average value and ask the question, how does it change? Because I can't assume anymore that the 
average vulnerability is constant. Right? So we have this initial attack rate multiplied by this average. This average is changing with time. Recall that the definition of the average vulnerability in this heterogeneous population is this distribution weighted by epsilon divided by the number of susceptible individuals. And therefore, if I want to find the derivative with respect to time, I would write out a prime b minus b prime that's a dot a all over b squared. And it seems like a lot of moves for me to do with 10 minutes left. So can I skip them? It's OK. You trust me that I'm going to do it right. At the end of the day, after you do these derivatives and you appropriately take care of things, you get minus beta i average value of epsilon squared minus the average squared. In other words, The speed at which this decreases is hit by the force of infection. Obviously, if there's no infection, we don't have a rate. We don't move and decrease. But the variance is what drives it. Because the more variance we have, the more likely we are to pull out a big thing and then more rapidly decrease. It also tells you that in a homogeneous population, we don't have any change by definition, because we're always taking an individual with the same vulnerability. So that's cool, but I want to just do one last move and then I'll wrap it up today. I think I'm almost at time. This is, a, I think, for, should be for everyone here a new concept, even if you've done SIR models before and even if you've seen the outbreak conditions and the endemic uh, equilibrium and so on. So what have I done? I've introduced, I've introduced a heterogeneous population into an SIR-like framework. I've shown you that you can begin to write down the full population level dynamics in terms of the average vulnerability, but the vulnerability is itself changing. And now you see that I would need to make some assumptions to close this. Because you see there's a bit of a problem. I want to figure out how the susceptibles change. To do that, I need to know how the mean vulnerability changes. To figure out how the mean vulnerability changes, I need to know something about the variance. But then the variance could change, and I could just keep going on for and forever. Right? It turns out, and if you want to, you can read more. I'll post the paper. There are eigen distributions of this sculpting process that preserve their shape. And I'm going to use one as a point of convenience. There are others as well. And it's interesting, a bit outside today's scope, to say that this sculpting can actually move things closer to these eigen distributions in which we know something about the relationship between the variance and the mean. And if we do that, and that shape is preserved, we can actually close this system of equations. Let us for a moment assume that we have an exponential-like distribution. But I'm going to just set this equal to 1 arbitrarily. And therefore, I don't have to have my prefactor. And if I take the integral of that over all epsilons, I get 1. This turns out is preserved by this process. If I start with exponentials, I always have exponentials because everything is being hit by this epsilon. It just rescales the distribution. And therefore, epsilon, the variance, is just epsilon bar squared. If this is the case, then what I see is that s dot is minus beta i s epsilon bar. And epsilon bar dot is equal to minus beta i epsilon bar squared, which means that ds d epsilon bar, 
The force of infection is just saying how fast the system runs, but it's not telling me how I sculpt. It just sets the speed of the sculpting, not the sculpting shape, is equal to S over epsilon bar, which means you can see I end up getting log of S is equal to log of epsilon bar plus some constant. But I can arbitrarily set this to 1 initially because everyone was susceptible. I say the average vulnerability, which is just scaling this attack rate beta, is equal to 1, which means this constant is 0, which means, radically speaking, epsilon bar is equal to s if we have an exponential distribution, which means s dot minus beta i s squared. The heterogeneity fundamentally alters the nonlinearity of the core SIR model. And what's notable about this is that if we were then to look at the i dot equation, which is now beta i s squared minus gamma i, right? Because now in this simplified model, I have this. You can see initially. We have beta over gamma s squared minus 1. Initially, the speed will be the same because s is 1. And the r naught will still be beta over gamma. We'll measure things initially that will seem exactly the same. But yet, you can see that the s herd immunity threshold will be 1 over r naught to the 1 half, rather than 1 over r naught. In other words, if we look at the number of people infected, R0, and the number infected at the herd immunity threshold, here's 1. Here's the classic result, 1 minus 1 over R0. Heterogeneity should, on average, tend to decrease the size of the outbreak. For the reason that I asked you at the very beginning, and a few of you were willing to answer, because it sculpts the distribution, removing the, those who are more likely to be infected, leaving those less likely to be infected, and turning itself off faster. This is interesting, but also dangerous in the same way that the classic SIR model is also dangerous. If I think of the SIR model, it says that in the absence of heterogeneity, Things like an R0 of 3 or 4 would lead to herd immunity thresholds of 75 or 80% before you have overshoot. So you're getting into the 90s in terms of who gets infected. Once you have this kind of heterogeneity, you can drop this down significantly. And if R0 gets low enough, this effect could mean and lead to conclusions like I hinted at that Gomez et al. said, would you have herd immunity thresholds of 6% or 10% or 20%, which is clearly not the case. We've gone way past that. Nonetheless, I want to make this very important point that when we make a homogeneity assumption, it's actually an extreme assumption with respect to the possibilities. It's much more likely there is some heterogeneity. And the heterogeneity fundamentally affects the nonlinearity intrinsic in the model. I was able to solve it and put it in this form because I made the simplifying assumption. In general, it's not that easy to do. But nonetheless, it captures the idea of how having this heterogeneity actually leads to changes in the order. That's all I have for today. I'm at time. I'm happy to continue the conversation. But tomorrow, if we want to talk more about this, I can start with this. But then I will continue with two other modules, probably one on generation intervals and one on, um, and one on behavior. See you tomorrow. Or we can chat at coffee break. Thanks.